How many of you are glad that we serve a God who fights our battles for us, that he's already won the victory on our behalf? Come on, can we just give him a little bit of love this morning? Man, he's torn apart the sea. He's led us through the deep. Man, if that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. But man, the question, the question is this. What do we do when the victory takes a while? What do we do when it doesn't happen right away? What do we do when we wait on God? And I think it's fitting that we sang this song this morning. It's really a Holy Spirit thing because this isn't in my notes. It isn't anywhere in there, but the Israelites were in bondage for 400 years. For 400 years, they prayed for deliverance. For 400 years, they were enslaved, they were beaten, they were abused, they were taken advantage of, and they prayed for deliverance for 400 years. Deliverance came God parted the waters and he led them out to the promised land. But for 400 years, they waited. I think some of us probably couldn't get four minutes after praying to God for deliverance. God, I need you to do this. I need you to answer this prayer. I need you to open this door. I need you to provide this thing. And then when it doesn't happen in four minutes, we give up. We say, well, I must not have the prayer right. I must not have the right connection. But sometimes God says to wait. Sometimes God says to wait. And so today, we're going to talk about what to do while you wait. And I know you're still standing. I know you're probably like, man, would you shut up so I can sit down? But I want us to read this scripture together. This is our key text for today. It's in Acts. It's in Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And it says this. It's really simple. It says, on one occasion while he was eating with them, This is Jesus with his disciples. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. But wait for the gift my father promised has promised what to do while you wait. That's what we're going to talk about today. You guys go ahead and take a seat. Man, thanks so much for being in church today. I really believe that God has something for us today. I know God had something for me waiting in this passage when I read it several weeks ago. Because as we began to meet back in person, as we kind of all came out of quarantine in isolation, we, we came back, we started to gather again in person, and some of you were there right away, and then some of you have taken your time, and that's okay, and we still have those that are joining us online, which is awesome. We all do our thing and our time when we feel comfortable. And, but when we started meeting back in person, we started talking as a staff and as a leadership team and as pastors about this you know, season that we're in as a church. This season collectively, Big C Church, not just Avalon Church, but Big C Church, this season that we're in of really almost relaunching the church in a way. You know, we've uncovered, we've realized things that, hey, maybe we could do better or even ways that we can be more innovative and do things a little bit differently. But this idea of really relaunching the church, and so when we started talking about that, I know for me personally, I just felt the Holy Spirit leading me to the book of Acts. Because if you're familiar with the Bible, the book of Acts comes after the Gospels. It's after Jesus was crucified. He rose from the dead, and then he ascended into heaven, and he really left his disciples with a mission, and that was to go and make other disciples of all nations and people. And then he ascended into heaven, and the rest of Acts is about the original church starting out, of which we today, gathered here and joining online, we are a part of that same church that started back then. That, that's just an amazing fact that God's church through all these years, all these centuries, 
still is going and seeing people come to a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. I just think that's amazing. But when we started talking about relaunching the church, I just felt the Spirit saying, hey, I want you to read through Acts. And so I was like, okay, you know, because when the Holy Spirit tells you to do something, you do it. At least you should. If you're not doing it, then start. (laughs) But when I started reading in Acts, it didn't take long. And that's usually the case when God says to do something. He's got something in mind. He's got something planned for you. And I got to verse 4, and I read this with a new new lens. I I looked at it through a different lens than I've ever looked at it before because I saw this word, but wait. Wait. It seems like a small, insignificant, four-letter word, but it really had a whole new meaning for me. So I started really thinking back. I'm like, well, let's see. Well, where are the disciples at in this process? So the disciples were called by Jesus to drop everything, to, to leave their families, to leave their jobs, to leave everything that they had ever known, and to follow this man called Jesus. And when they set out to follow Jesus, they thought that Jesus was the promised Messiah, but in a different way, not the way that we know him today, but they thought he was gonna come and he was gonna restore the kingdom of Israel And so they got behind this man. They thought he was going to overthrow the Roman government and that oppression was going to end and that he was going to take over David's throne. He was the one that they had been waiting for, that prophecies had told about. And for three years, they followed him. For three years, they set aside everything that they were striving for in life and they set out to follow Jesus. But then in year three, something happened. They went with Jesus. He went into Jerusalem the the week before he went to the cross, and and everybody was super excited. They thought, this is the moment. This is the time where he's going to take over. And then several days later, this man's hanging on a cross, and he's killed, and he's dead. And then three days later, he rose from the grave. We know the story. But see, the disciples' year didn't play out the way they thought it was going to play out. It didn't happen the way they thought it was going to happen, and it really turned their world upside down. And so I started thinking about this is where the disciples are at. The last month or two or three months has just been crazy for them. Things that they thought were going to happen, things they thought they were going to get to be a part of didn't happen. And now Jesus is telling them, in a way, to go back to Jerusalem to quarantine and to isolate themselves and to wait. And I was like, man, that sounds familiar, right? That sounds familiar. Since March of 2020, we all realize, oh, 2020 has, is not gonna play out the way we thought it was gonna play out. Some people thought they were going to get to have a graduation. Some people thought they were going to get to have prom. Some people thought they were going to get to play their senior year of baseball. That didn't happen. Our year has not played out the way we thought it was going to play out. And we've had to do a lot of waiting. Have we not? Have we not had to do a lot of waiting? We've had to do a lot of waiting over the past couple months. We've had to wait on different things. We've had to wait to go back to school. Some parents are still waiting for kids to get out of the house and go back to school. Lord, come quickly. Send a miracle. I need them to go back home so I can get on with my life. So some of us are still in a season of waiting. Some people are waiting to get married. Phil, that's for you, brother. The Holy Spirit's speaking this morning. He's speaking. But some of us are waiting to get married. We've got a lot of weddings coming up for the rest of the year. I think that's really awesome. Love is in the air. So anyway, love. yes, uh, we've, we've got some proud parents back here. And so anyway, love is in the air. So if, if someone needs to get married, we need to, we'll meet in the back. Go to Next Step Central. If, if you're like, man, I need to get somebody married. I can't get them out of the house. Okay, we'll go to Next Step Central. We'll get them paired up with somebody. But some people are just waiting to get married. Weddings have had to be put on hold. Some of us have waited for negative test results. Some of us still might be waiting for a prognosis of some sort, a diagnosis, praying for it to be negative. 
Some of us have had to wait for jobs. Some people have lost their jobs. We've had to wait on new jobs. We've had to wait for stimulus checks. We've had to wait for cures. And we could sit here all day and list the things we've had to wait for over the last several months. But all in all, our year has not played out the way we thought it was going to play out. We've had to do a lot of waiting. And so when I read this scripture, man, that word stuck out to me like it could have been bold, it could have been underlined, you know, it could have been highlighted any more than it stuck out to me. Christ said, but wait for the gift my father has promised. See, I think we're guilty a lot of times of thinking that when we're waiting on something, that nothing is happening. We think that when we're called by God to wait, that nothing is happening. But here today, I want us to understand this, that something is happening when nothing is happening. Did we get that? That when nothing is happening, something is happening. See, God uses the waiting in our lives to grow us. He uses it to shape us into the man, into the woman that he wants you to be. And he says, sometimes you gotta wait. Sometimes you have to wait. How many parents I got in the room? How many, how many parents you got kids? I've got a soon-to-be two-year-old daughter, and that's hard to believe that she is growing up so fast. And man, there's so many times that Christina and I, we have to tell Charlotte, not now, not now. You know, when the, when, when the kid comes into the kitchen, you know, 10 minutes before dinner and they see the, the pack of cookies on the, on the counter and they're like, oh, I want one of those. Well, not now. Well, why? They don't understand. They have a hard time kind of connecting the dots of why I want that. Why can't I have it? And so we as parents, we have to do a lot of, well, not now, not now. I can't really explain it to you. You're not gonna understand, but not now. Because we as parents, what? We know what's best for our child. We know that cookies right before we eat is not a good idea because you're not going to eat your dinner. And I think it's crazy that we as adults will tell our kids that, but we turn right around and we do the same thing to God. We do the same thing to God. We, we feel like we need something so bad, and we get down on our knees and we pray for it, and God says, well, well not now. Not because that thing you're praying for is, is bad in and of itself, but because the timing isn't right. And God says, well, if you wait for it, it's going to mean so much more on the other end. And so right now, I just need you to wait. See, God uses that to train us and to, to make us into the people that he wants us to be. And there are several things here. I just want us to walk through this because I think scripture is crystal, crystal clear when it comes to what waiting on God really does. And so I want to fly through these scriptures. If you find yourself today, like a lot of us do, we're, we, we come across these seasons a lot in our life where we're waiting for a miracle, we're waiting for a prayer to be answered, we're waiting for a door to open up. It's just so many things that we have to wait on in our life. And so what I want us to talk about today is what to do while we wait. But before we get there, I want us to understand what God is doing when we're waiting and so the first thing that we see, we're going to fly through this, and these scriptures are going to pop on the screen really fast. But if you, if, if you need somewhere to turn, if you're like, man, I just need some help, Scripture has verses upon verses upon verses about people waiting on God. There's, there's 40 years here. There's, there's 40 days there. There's 10 days here of people throughout the Bible waiting on God to move and to answer prayer. And so Scripture is, is full of examples and, and, and verses that we can turn to. The first thing we see is that when we wait on God, he increases our strength. Isaiah 40, 30 through 31 says this. It says, even youths grow tired and weary. How many have ever felt tired and weary before? I have. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Those who hope in the Lord, those that wait on God, those that wait with a purpose, they will renew their strength. 
So the first thing it does is when we wait on God, he increases our strength. The second thing that he does is he produces endurance, character, and hope. Romans 5, 2 through 4 says, Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, well, not only what? Not only do we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. How many of you understand that when you have to wait, usually it means you have to suffer? Usually it means you have to suffer some sort of pain and trial. And Paul says right here is not only do we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Because why? Because knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. So we rejoice in our sufferings. Just like we stand here and we worship God for all that he does, we should, we should be worshiping God and praising him because of the sufferings that we have to go through. We should be praising him because of the waiting that we have to go through because we know that through it, it produces endurance, it produces character, and it produces hope in our lives. The third thing that God does when, when we wait on him is he draws us closer to himself. John 15, 7 says this, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. See, the closer we get to God, the more we learn to think his thoughts. And so sometimes we wonder, man, I'm praying this prayer, I'm praying for this thing, but it just seems like it's not happening. God's not answering my prayer. See, the more we get to know him, the more we spend time with him, the more we spend time in his word, the more that we spend time in prayer with God, the more we get to know him, the more we'll understand his will, and the more our will agrees with his, the more we can be assured that our prayers will be answered. So you wanna know how to get your prayers answered is align your will with his. Spend time in his presence. Spend time in his word. Not just reading it and rushing on with your day, but meditate on it. Meditate on it. Like, like chew it up. Digest it. Make, it. make it a part of who you are. Make it a part of what you know on the inside. In your heart is true. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So he draws us closer to himself the fourth thing he does is he gives us guidance and direction. Psalm 25, four through five says this, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me for you are the God of my salvation. For you, I what? Wait all the day long. Teach me to know your ways. Show me which way I should go. Teach me your paths. And while you're doing that, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. That's what the psalmist says. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. In all your ways, not some of them, not only when it goes good, not only when you feel like it, but in all your ways, in everything, submit to him. In everything, surrender and he'll give you guidance, he'll give you direction, even in the waiting, even when it hurts. The fifth thing that God does when we wait on him is he makes us confident of the future. Psalm 27, 13 through 14, I remain confident of this. Mm. How many of you just need a little bit of confidence in your life? How many of you just need to believe that God's got it under control? How many of you need to believe that God has the answer? The psalmist says here, I remain confident of this. I remember when this verse really settled in for me. I was in a season of my life, Christine and I, we had left our life back in South Carolina to pursue full-time ministry, and we had moved to Georgia. We were living up in the Alpharetta, Canton area, and we were living in this family's basement for what seemed like 10 years. It was, seemed like forever. We were just in a season of waiting. We seemed like we were in a holding pattern of like, well, God, what are you, what are you doing? 
what are you doing? We had lots of ups and downs. God moved. God taught us so much. But there was this one night where I just couldn't sleep. I couldn't, I couldn't keep my eyes closed because my mind was going a mile a minute. Like, God, what are you doing? I don't understand what I'm having to walk through. I don't understand what you're trying to do. And so I just got up and I went into the living room. I turned on the lamp and I grabbed my Bible and I just started to read. I just started to read the Psalms because there's, I mean, you could read anywhere in the Bible and get encouragement, but when you read these Psalms and you read what David, who wrote most of the Psalms, went through in his life, he had a lot of seasons of waiting. We don't have time to get into that. That's another message for another day. But he did a lot of waiting, and so a lot of these Psalms come from that attitude and that posture. And I remember I started in Psalm 1, and I just started reading. I had a notebook there with me, and I just started writing stuff down. And I got to Psalm 27, and I read the psalm, and I got to these two verses, and I just stopped. I just stopped. I put my pen down, and I just, that was it. That's what I needed to know. I needed to know that I will remain confident of this. And this is what I read. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. I will see the goodness of the Lord. How many of you just need a little bit more goodness from the Lord? How many of you just need a little bit more grace from the Lord? How many of you just need a little bit more mercy, a little bit more love, a little bit more peace in your life from the Lord? You can remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living but you have to do what? Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. I remember reading that and I was like, I get it. I get it now. I just got to wait. And there was many times in that season where I just felt like this desire to go out. Well, maybe I just need to get a job. Maybe I just need to find something to do. I just need to get out of here for a minute. I need to re put my mind on something else because obviously this isn't working out right now. And God just said no. I just need you to wait. Would you please just wait? Would you just wait on me? And while you wait, be confident. Be confident that you're going to see my goodness in the land of the living. And boy, did he come through in a miraculous way. But I had to wait. I had to wait. See, the Bible goes on and on. We could, we could stand here all day and just read verse after verse after verse of God illustrating in the Bible what it means to wait on him. So just while God, while God is working in our waiting, on the other side, there's work that we have to do as well. And so here's where I want us to, to get to today. There's three things that I think we can look at the disciples all the way back, if we remember our key text back in Acts you know, Jesus gave them the command, go back to Jerusalem, don't leave, wait on me, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father, I need you just to wait. And so there's, there's three things that we can see the disciples do that we can apply to our life today when we come into a season of waiting. So what do you do while you wait? The first thing we see is be obedient where you are. Be obedient where you are. Acts 1 Verse 12, this is after Jesus ascended into heaven. It says this, it says, Then the disciples returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. So Jesus told them several days earlier, they were eating dinner. He said, hey, when this thing goes down, I need you to do this. I need you just to go back to Jerusalem. I need you to go back to the upper room, all of you together, and I need you to, to stay there. Don't go anywhere else. Don't do anything else. I need you to just stay there. I need you to wait. And so when Jesus finally ascended and he left, the disciples did just that. They obeyed, and they went back to Jerusalem to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. You see, the disciples were obedient because they understood that when God promises something in our life, you can take it to the bank it's worth waiting on. It's worth 
the wait. Doesn't matter how long you have to wait. The disciples didn't know if this was gonna, is this gonna take 10 hours? Is this gonna take 10 days? Is this gonna take 10 years? I don't know. The Israelites had to stay in bondage for 400 years. We might not even get to see the promise, but what he's promised us is that he will send the Holy Spirit. We just need to go back and we need to be obedient and we need to wait. And so they did that. They knew that when God asked us to wait for something, we can believe it's worth the wait. It's worth the wait. Christina and I have some friends. They used to go to church here. Uh, their name's Jason and Shannon Kang. Some of you may remember them. And so they're probably watching online if anybody wants to give them some love. They might be tuned in this morning watching us. If you're watching, drop us a comment. Let us know. We love you. They, they moved down to Tallahassee. Um, J- Jason got a job down there, so he moved down there. But we go and visit them quite often. And when we go and visit, the, the one thing that we focus our time and attention on is eating. We eat so much. The first thing we do is we pull in, we get to their house, and we get in the truck, and we go to Sam's, and we just stock up. Stock up for the week on all kinds of meat, all kind of candy, all kind of sodas, all kinds of drinks, because that, that's what we're going to do. Our goal is to gain some weight, and so we're just going to eat. And so when, when we go, we always have several meals that we, we do staple dinners that every time we're together, we always do. And one of those meals is we do a steak dinner. How many steak fans we got? in the house today. Oh yeah, every man should have your hand in the air. If you don't have your hand in the air, then um, question your manhood. But anyway, we, I love steak. I love a good steak. And so Jason, several months ago when we were visiting, he said, hey, we're gonna do steaks tonight. I'm like, oh great, you know. Hey, well, a few minutes, we'll get this out and we'll go throw them on the grill. It's gonna be delicious and we're gonna eat soon. It's gonna be awesome. And so then he pulls out this aquarium looking thing and he puts it on the counter, and he's got this tube that goes down in it, and, I'm, and he starts taking the steaks and, and put them in this vacuum-sealed plastic thing. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, bro, what, what are we doing? Like, what is this? I'm like, are we going to boil the steaks? I don't think that's a good idea. I know you're a great cook, and I know you know what you're doing, but I don't know if boiling the steaks is really what we want to do. And he said, just hold on. He's like, this is going to change your life. This is going to be delicious. And so what he had, he told me, this is what they call sous vide cooking. I don't know if you're familiar with that. We got any cooks in the house? We got a couple people nodding their heads. But what you do is you take your meat, whatever it is, fish, chicken, steak, whatever, and you vacuum seal it and it and it cooks it at a constant temperature in the water. Cooks it at a constant temperature. And I was like, okay, well, Jason knows what he's doing. He's super smart. He's smarter than I am. And so I'm just going to go along for the ride. And then I was like, well, we'll, we'll eat and it's going to be delicious. And so over an hour later, we finally get to eat the steaks. And I'm like, well, man, we could have just grilled these in a matter of minutes and we would be done. We'd have the dishes done, but no, we're, we're waiting on this aquarium thing to cook our meat. But he, it gets done finally. He opens it up, he puts it on the plate and we sit down to eat and it changed my life. <laughs> changed my life. The best steak I've probably ever eaten in my life. The best piece of meat I've ever eaten in my life. It was delicious. Your fork can just pull the meat apart. It is wonderful. If you've never had it before, I encourage you to try it. That's the commercial for today. And so whoever owns the sous vide, whatever, they can thank me later. But uh, this changed my life. And, And what I thought after I took that first bite was this, that was worth the wait. That was worth the wait. We've all had things in our life that we've waited to play out. We've maybe waited our lifetime for something, and then we look at it, and we're like, man, that was worth the wait. And so the disciples knew Jesus had promised the gift from the Father, which was the Holy Spirit. They had walked with Jesus for three years. They saw blinded eyes start to see. They, they saw deaf ears start to hear. They saw dead men walk out of graves through the power of the Holy Spirit. And now Jesus has promised, hey, I need you to go back. I need you to stay in Jerusalem. I need you to wait on me because that same power that I had flowing through me to do these miracles is now going to flow through you. But to get it, you got to go back and you got to wait. They knew that the gift of the Holy Spirit, that thing that the Father had promised to pour out on them was worth the wait. And so they went back and they obeyed. They were obedient where they were. And patience is something that we do very well. I don't know about you, but I'm very impatient. 
a very impatient person. I don't like to wait on things. And that's just a, a byproduct of our society, our culture. We as, as people, we don't like to wait on anything. We live in, you, you would say, a, sort of a microwave culture where we want what we want and we want it now. We would rather take that steak and put it in the microwave and nuke it for a few minutes and eat it so we can get on with whatever we want to get on with instead of waiting on the aquarium to cook the meat. And we, we want what we want when we want it. It's all about us. But what we need to realize is that it's not about us. It's about what God wants to do through us. It's not about us. The story isn't about us. It's about what God wants to do through us. And in order to work through us, we have to wait. We have to wait. We have to be obedient where you are. So whatever you're walking through, if you're in a season of waiting, if you're waiting on a job, if you're waiting on whatever, wherever he has you now, even if you're waiting on a job and you're not working, it doesn't matter. God can still work in your waiting. You just have to wait on him and be obedient where he has you. The second thing that we need to do is we need to pray constantly. Acts 1.14, we keep reading down through that chapter. It says this. It says, they all join together. This is talking about the disciples. They're with their wives. They're with their children. They're with their families. They're all joined together, and they were constantly in prayer. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Notice that they didn't just go back and pray once and then just get on with it. They prayed constantly. They prayed constantly. Some translations even throw in this word called supplication. I know that's a big word. You know, I'm not going to spell it for you because I'd mess it up. But this word supplication means to have a sense of desperation and earnestness. They went back and they prayed with desperation and earnestness for God to move, for God to fulfill his promise God, we want the Holy Spirit. God, would you give it to us? Would you answer our prayer? This isn't just a going through the motions type prayer. This is I can't do this without a miraculous move of God kind of prayer. I can't go any further. I can't leave here without you. So when God calls us to do something, when he gives us a, a mission, when he gives us a purpose, we can't do it without him. And so we need to pray with earnestness. We need to pray constantly. So if you're in a season of waiting, be praying. Be actively requesting the Father to move on your behalf. Don't just pray before the meal. Pray constantly. Pray constantly. The third thing and final thing we need to do when we wait is we need to worship while you wait. You need to worship while you wait. There's a parallel uh, reference to this story that we're, we're studying this morning over in Luke chapter 24, verses 50 through 53. This is the same occurrence of Jesus ascending into heaven. It says this, it says, when he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, that's Jesus leading his disciples. When he's led them out, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Jesus blessed his disciples. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they, the disciples, worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually. It's kind of the same word we saw there with prayer. They were constantly praying, but they were continually at the temple praising God. They worshiped while they waited. And sometimes I think this is what we do, church. We enter into a season of waiting and we get so focused, we get so focused on that thing we're asking God to do. We focus on it so much that we make an idol out of whatever it is we're asking God for. And we kind of leave him in the background. We leave him in the background. We begin to worship whatever thing that we're praying for God to do. And that thing we want God to do, that doesn't mean it's bad. That means we just got our priorities out of whack. That means we're worshiping the thing we're praying for. We're worshiping our job more than God himself. We're, we're worshiping that loved one more than, than God. I know that's, that's, that's hard to hear this morning, but we gotta keep our priorities straight. God has to be the focus. 
He is the one that we worship. You see, worship is those, that thing that we place utmost importance in. That thing we focus on more than anything else, that's what we worship. Worship isn't what we just did 20 minutes ago. That's a part of it. That's a part of us fixing our attention on Him. But worship is so much more than that. We worship all the time. We're always worshiping something. And so the, the thing that happens so sadly is that we begin to worship the gift over the giver. We begin to worship the gift over the giver. And one way that we can fix this is we need to focus on the cross. We focus on the cross. Because here's, here's the thing. When we focus on the cross, we understand that there is nothing, and I emphasize that word, there is nothing that God won't do for you. There is nothing that he won't do for you, his child, because he loves you. And the cross paints that picture beautifully. Really, it's ugly if you think about it. God said, I love you so much. Here's my son. I'm gonna nail him to this tree and he's gonna bleed and he's gonna die so that things might be made right between us. In church, if you need to fix your attention this morning, fix it there. Fix it on the cross. That'll change how you worship. That'll change how you live. But you gotta see it. You gotta see it. If we don't see it, things won't change. There's a worship leader, his name's Matt Redman, and he said this thing one time, I was either at a conference or I don't remember where I heard him say it. But when I heard him say it, it, it just, it meant so much to me because it put so much meaning behind what I do and it helped me understand what I do on a weekly basis and as a, a part of my life when, when I lead people in worship, he said this, he said, worship is not so much a place of singing as it is a place of seeing. <laughs> and man, that changed my world. That rocked my world because it, up till then it was all about the melody. It was all about the drum solo. It was all about the chord chart. It was all about this awesome rhythm. But he said, it's not about that. It's about seeing. And if you can see, you'll worship. So if you're in a season of waiting this morning, fix your eyes on the cross. Fix your eyes on the cross. It'll change your perspective. It'll change everything. In, in closing, I want to close this out with this. I'm going to walk back here a second because I have this fancy thing to kind of paint a picture, kind of summarize all this for us. This is, this is a bamboo tree. This is the best that I could do, so y'all bear with me. This stuff grows in my backyard, and I hate it, but it's going to come in handy today. And so the bamboo tree, this is a small one, by the way. They get so much bigger. But the, the bamboo tree, specifically the, the Chinese bamboo tree over in, you guessed it, China. The bamboo tree starts out as a little shoot in the ground. It comes up out of the ground and it stays a small shoot out of the ground for five years. For five years, it stays this small insignificant thing. And then after five years, it will grow up to 90 feet in 90 days. Now, in nature, that's an amazing feat. That's an amazing feat. This one obviously isn't 90 feet tall. I couldn't get it in the Ford Explorer this morning. But the Chinese bamboo tree can grow up to 90 feet in 90 days. So here's the question. Here's the question. When did the Chinese bamboo tree grow? 
When did it grow? And the answer, a lot of people would look at that and be like, well, it grew 90 feet in 90 days. That, that's awesome. That's an awesome feat. But the answer lies under the ground. The answer lies under the ground. So the Chinese bamboo tree shoots up out of the ground for five years. It stays this small shoot. While it's a small shoot, it's growing under the surface a massive root system that's preparing it to support the weight of that 90-foot tree. So in five years, when it starts to grow to be 90 feet tall, it's ready to hold the weight. Here's the thing, like if it didn't produce this massive root system under the ground over that five year span, when it shot up to be 90 feet tall, it would fall, it would collapse. It wouldn't last, it wouldn't serve its purpose. And so this morning church, God's called us all to serve him. God's given us all a ministry. God's placed a calling on all of our lives. I know you might not work at a church. I know you might not be a pastor, but God's given us all a purpose. He's given us all a reason to exist. But it's in the waiting that we reach our potential. You'll never be the man. You'll never be the woman that God wants you to be if you don't have seasons of waiting. So what we have to do is we have to learn to wait well because God wants to use you to do something great. And I know it might not feel like it at times. I know it might not seem like it's working out the way you want it to work out. It, it might seem that life couldn't get any worse. But God has a plan and a purpose for your life just like he has a plan and a purpose for mine. But sometimes we have to wait. And we have to learn how to wait well. It requires patience. It requires prayer. And it requires praise. That's what we do when we wait. We wait patiently. We pray constantly. And we praise the whole time we wait. We have to learn how to wait. Well, Father, we thank you that you love us enough to make us wait. We thank you that you know what we need more than we know what we need. And so this morning we surrender our lives to you that in seasons of waiting, whether we're walking through it right now or whether it's just around the corner and we don't realize it, we all go through seasons of waiting. So God, would you teach us how to wait well? When we do walk into that season, would you help us to do these three things? Would you help us to be obedient and be patient? Would you help us to pray constantly? And would you help us to worship while we wait? God, we love you and we want you to do a work in our life that we could never imagine. God, would you do a work today? Would you change us? Amen. Amen, church. Well, I hope, hope you feel encouraged today. I believe God is speaking to lives. I believe he's moving. And so I pray for you as you leave, man. When I when I read this scripture the other day, I knew the Holy Spirit had something in store. And I didn't know I was really gonna be speaking today then, but he planted a seed for today. So I hope you feel encouraged in your walk with Jesus. Well, before you go, if you're watching online, don't tune out yet. We have our next steps for the day. We always wanna have application. Anytime we come, and we hear from the word of God, we don't wanna leave and not put into practice. And so we have next steps every week, they're on the screen. So if, you, if you're here today and this is your first time with us, please fill out the next step card. It's in the seat pocket in front of you. Please fill that out, take it to Next Step Central or drop it in the, the giving box on your way out. And so fill that out for us. If, if you today, this is serious. If you're here today and you're like, man, I hear you talking about Jesus. I hear you talking about the cross. I don't, I don't really understand what you're talking about, but I want, I want to feel that. I want to be loved like that. 
There are people that can talk to you. Please go to Next Step Central for that. If you're here today and you want to be baptized, you can fill out the Next Step card. If you just need prayer, just go right out here. Somebody will pray with you. And so we want to make sure that we're moving, we're advancing, we're growing in our walk with Jesus. Amen? All right, lastly but not least, giving for the day. So thank you so much, all of you that give on a a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, consistently give to support the ministry of Avalon Church. There are stories throughout the room. There are stories of many people online that have been changed by the ministry of Avalon Church. We thank you for being a participant in that. So if you want to give today, there are three ways that you can give. You can give online or you can give at the giving kiosk out here in the lobby or you can give by texting the amount you want to give to 84321, 84321. You can give that way. And so thank you so much. You guys go ahead and stand. Thank you so much for being in church. We're so excited about what God has in store for us moving forward. You guys have a great week. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.